<laughs> they really do smell good. So uh, this is where we're going to be in just a few minutes when the government is a threat. Wow, from the book of Daniel. What a quinky dink. I, I do want to bring this to your attention. Harry had mentioned it. Uh, uh, we have a prophecy update, our annual New Year's Eve prophecy update. It will be live online for everybody that lives across the world. Uh, but we have it here every year, and it's going to be a fantastic time. There are things I wanted to share last week that I didn't have time to, and I thought, oh, this will be great. We have New Year's Eve coming. Uh, but then you look at so many things happening right now. Man, this is unbelievable, isn't it? Uh, we live in exciting days indeed. In fact, maybe we won't even make it to New Year's. And we'll get raptured before then. Does that sound like good news to anybody? Amen. <laughs> Amen. A couple of other things. Let's assume we get into 2020. Uh, Jam Markell's going to be here. We have a few mini prophecy conferences that are going to take place Sunday nights. Jam Markell will be here in January. I think January 19th. If that's a Sunday, that's when she's coming. Um, February, David Tal from the IDF is going to be here along with Don Stewart, both of them. And then in April, we're going to do a Holocaust Remembrance uh, Day evening with uh, Olivier Melnick. We're working on getting some Messianic worship for the night and some other things. And we're inviting, uh, I was asked through chosen people to invite as many uh, Jewish people, go to the synagogues throughout Southern California that might be interested in coming here. So if you know of any, invite them. The date is on the Hope for Our Times events. You can look it up because I can't remember what it is right now. So we have really exciting things that are coming up along with uh, some other prophecy conferences that are not going to be here uh, at this church. All three of those, let's see, are the three here. They're all free, by the way, just so you know also. So invite your friends. That's going to be a great time. Uh, and then I, I think that's it. I'm confused by the smell of burgers. That's, so uh, we look at this, Daniel chapter 6. Now think of this. Um, when we began in Daniel chapter 1, Jerusalem was besieged by Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel, among many other Jews, were taken captive to Babylon. Uh, Daniel was probably a young teenager at the time, uh, and we've been with Daniel all the way through uh, the time where he was threatened in Babylon, uh, he was threatened at first by the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and then Nebuchadnezzar realized, wow, this did Daniel and his friends, these are some wise men. Remember when they wanted to eat vegetables? And uh, so all the vegetarians thought that was it. Now we've been proven right. No, it has nothing to do with being a vegan. Um, uh, but it was honoring the Sabbath laws that God had given him. And Daniel was going to always keep God first. And that's what, what, what Daniel did. Um, when we were in chapter 5, there was a new king. It was Belshazzar, I believe, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And by then, many years had passed. Many say that Belshazzar, by the time he was king, Daniel was 80 years old. So he goes from being young, he's, he, he loves the Lord, he puts the Lord first. And uh, then you don't hear from him for decades. And then he's 80, and all of a sudden he shows up on the scene again. Uh, then he shows up on the scene now, and, and most scholars believe that Daniel is probably 90 years old by the time he shows up in Daniel chapter 6, and he's threatened with being thrown into the lion's den. Uh, it, it's literally, uh, Daniel's in a position when the government is a threat. So let's get a little bit of an update of some things in uh, the world right now. Uh, we have this. I love this. Uh, End of the American Dream. Gotta love that title. Have you noticed that the crazy people are starting to take over our society? <laughs> have you? Yeah. yeah, and they're starting to take over the government. And I'm looking at the government. Listen, I, I firmly believe the government is, is becoming more and more of a threat all the time. I look at what's coming in the future. There are crazy people that are wanting to run things. Sometimes I actually wonder the, uh, how many of them are demon-possessed. Because the cra these things they're thinking of, I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. And there's so many people willing to vote for this type of thing. Uh, we'll save details on, on the crazy people for New Year's Eve prophecy update. Uh, there's this. Tucker Carlson said, the territorial integrity of Ukraine is essential 
but our own borders mean nothing. I thought, what a great concept, right? I mean, uh, we have this impeachment hearing going on, all this Ukraine stuff. Well, what about our own borders here? Uh, yeah, people are all upset about the Ukraine, which, you know, is another situation all in of itself. And you look at this and go, again, we just have crazy people. I mean, I don't know. Let's go back to this, because this one is um, it's not working. Uh, there you go. Back to that. Crazy people. Okay. And care... Um, Council on American uh, uh, was Islamic relations. Um, goal is 30 Islamists elected to Congress. Uh, now that's nothing new if you've been studying Bible prophecy. You know this has been the goal and to eventually get something like Sharia law here in America. You look at anywhere in the world where Sharia law is, you wonder why people are trying to run out of these parts of the world where Sharia law is there. It's because they're threatened with life and death if you don't submit to these laws. This is unbelievable. When you look at Sharia law, Sharia law is as anti-homosexual as you can get, as anti-woman as you can get. Yet here in America, we have the LGBT group and the, these women's rights groups that are wanting Islam in America. You're thinking, you don't understand, you're the first target. And women women become the... the uh, the, they're, they're less valuable than cattle. And these women's groups think this stuff is great. And you look at this and you go, this is just insanity. Uh, that's crazy people that are taking over America, right? Okay. There's this. This reminds me of technology. And, and uh, listen, tech everywhere, but race to replace iPhones with glasses. So, what do you think, huh? You just start talking and listening. Now, I, I got my new earpiece things, right? Wireless. And so I just hooked up to my phone, put my phone in my pocket, and I look like a crazy person trying to run America, just walking around talking, but it, it does everything right here. So when you start thinking three, iPhones to replace, uh, uh, glasses to replace my iPhones, listen, this is not a hard leap when I've already got my earpieces that are pretty much almost replacing everything. And you look, you go, but this is just a reminder of technology. Everywhere we go, I think it was last week during the Prophecy Update, I read an article about how connected everybody is going to have to be by 2022, just two years from now. 2022, two years, you will have to be connected. Or, or it's going to be a matter of survival. In fact, um, I was talking with Ken this morning, and I don't have my phone with me, but it's like now, how many of you have a phone? A, a cell phone, okay. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So um, that was kind of a dumb question. If I asked you that 10 years ago, half of you would raise your hand, right? Now, eight years ago, I said, because how, how many of you have flip phones? And half of you would still raise your hand. If I asked that tonight, there's a couple of you that still do. <laughs> yeah, that's two. Yeah, yeah, three people flip, flip phones, praise the Lord. Hey, um, so, but you, you, you look, and it's hard to imagine getting by without a cell phone. I mean, it's hard to even, why do you even have a phone in your house anymore that's connected to, does anybody have, still have those? A few of you? Not, not a lot, right? Okay, listen, we have one in our house. I have no, no reason, we don't know why we have it. Um, it's there, it rings with, with people wanting to sell us stuff. We never, ever, 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 ever answer it, and it rings. And I don't even know why we have it. I think my wife told me it's connected with some package we have to have for internet and TV and everything else. So we're stuck with this worthless, stupid phone. This phone even has uh, one of those um, re recording things. Remember those? Remember the tape ones? Yeah, how many of you remember the tape ones? That shows how old we are. That's, that's some old stuff. Um, as smartphones begin using scanned IDs, skeptic site glitches, misuse, and a growing surveillance culture. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Revelation 13, right? This is not hard to figure out. And imagine crazy people will be running all these things. Dershowitz says Democrats are making up crimes like the KGB. Uh, listen to this. <clears throat> I'm going to report on this on my, my YouTube this week when I do it, just talking about America and the direction I see America going. But liberal Harvard professor Alan Dershowitz says... Democrats, after their failed collusion, now again, this is a liberal professor, right? He's not a conservative. He's been a Hillary Clinton supporter for years. 
um, investigation are still trying to create grimes out of nothing, emulating the KGB and the Soviet era. That they're very scary. They're very frightening to any civil libertarian. Whether you're Democrat or Republican, whether you come from New York or the middle of the country, you should be frightened by efforts to create crimes out of nothing. Commenting on the House Democrats' impeachment investigation based on alleged quid pro quo with Ukraine, Dershowitz said he has searched the federal criminal statutes from beginning to end, and he says, I couldn't find the crime. This is his quote. It reminds me of Lorenity, a Berea, not sure if I pronounced his name right, head of the KGB when he said to Stalin, show me the man and I'll find you the crime, which he really meant, I'll make up the crime. Uh, and so this is a quote from, again, Dershowitz. And so the Democrats are now making up crimes. So you look at this and you go, this, and as he says, again, this is, he's liberal. He's about as liberal as you could get. He says, this should have you very concerned if you're in New York or the middle of the country. You can, we can figure out what he's talking about. So I think of Daniel uh, and the place where we are tonight, Daniel 6, when the government becomes a threat. Um, and, and then there's this article that appeared in The Atlantic, How America Ends. And this article talks about the, the divide in America right now. Listen, I, I know this is going to be frightening to some of you. My hope, here's the good news, my hope is in God. Uh, my hope is not in America. Every single kingdom has fallen. America, now, now listen carefully, America is not the world leader when you look at the Bible in the last days. It is not. Um, some people just cannot handle that thought. Uh, God is the one who wants to get the glory. And God is going to get the glory. I'm hoping that America becomes not the world leader because of the rapture. But either way, we look, Jesus himself said, a country divided cannot stand. And uh, so I'll talk about America in my, in my YouTube that I do later on in the week. That'll be Wednesday. Uh, and then there's this, world's ultra-rich are preparing for market crash, warns the UBS. Uh, I'm not going to get much into this, but the Bible does talk about, in the tribulation, a great financial catastrophe. So there's always going to be ups and downs in the economy. There's been depressions and recessions. Always going to be, always going to be earthquakes, all those types of things. The ultimate great crash will not come until the tribulation period. And, uh, but this is just a reminder when you have people in these positions of leadership in the world in, in the area of the finances and economy that are looking at world economies and saying there's a problem not, not just with America. Listen, America is pretty strong still. But you, when you look at it um, in the big picture of things, there's some real problems that are out there. Uh, then there's this. Henry Kissinger warns of catastrophic conflicts unless China and the U.S. settle their differences. This, to me, is simply a reminder of Jesus' words, Matthew 24, of wars and rumors of wars. And these things just get bigger and bigger and bigger as we get to the time of the return of Jesus. And then there's this. Let's look at Israel for just a minute. Ex-security chief. Israel needs to attack Iran to stop nukes in the ring of fire. Um, I, I look at this, and I know from Isaiah chapter 17, God tells us that in the last days, uh, that Damascus, which is in Syria, is going to be destroyed. Um, and it implies it's going to be destroyed by the armies of Israel. Uh, many people have speculated what will happen. Uh, the, there's a nuke problem, I think it's in Bashar area of Iran, and many people are speculating that the, the Israeli Air Force is going to have to take that out. And uh, what kind of problems is that going to cause? Um, is, will it be the spark of the war where Israel wipes out Damascus? I don't know. But I do know, as I look at the Bible and things like that, I know that that is going to happen. Listen, this is another sign that Jesus is coming. And when we rightly are able to put everything into the right place, then we know these signs, in and of themselves, they may be bad news. So Jesus says, when you see the bad news, look up because there's good news. Don't just stare at the bad news, you got to look up. And uh, so it's, these are signs, the same way we have stop signs and in, in and signs that tell us the road is out and the bridge is out, right? They are signs that are warnings. So these are warning signs. Hey, look up. Jesus is coming. Uh, be ready, because when we go home, man, it's going to be awesome. Um, let me say this, too, before we go to 
uh, the next thing. People will ask me, why do you, where's the joy in this? Because I have a family, and uh, I want to see my kids grow up and the grandkids. And I, and, and I do too, you know, I want to see those things. Um, Christmas is still fun to me. Um, some people hate it. You know, some people in churches hate it. I probably just got blasted online for saying Christmas is fun to me. Um, but that's okay. I, I, I love my family, and it, 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 I plan vacations and things like that. Um, and, and people, they go, well, I want to see this happen. I want to see that happen. Listen, when Jesus comes back, you know the Lord. We are all with him. Our Father has a much better vacation plan than we do. And we forget that part. And we, we don't realize, we think, oh yeah, God, well, I'm going to outdo you. I've got this vacation in Maui. God's like, really? I want to show you. And you'll never, ever, ever be separated from each other again. And, and when you get the right perspective, it gives you hope. But we look at this with Israel. Um, Russian submarine is found near Israeli coast. And what do we know? We know that Russia is eventually, with, is, with Iran and Turkey, are going to attack Israel. You look at these, these again are warning signs that are flashing. Uh, and, and then there's, there's this that was not reported in CNN, ABC, NBC, CBS, MSNBC, or Fox News, uh, that Israel was under attack this week. All week, this is what we got in America, impeachment, and entertainment out of Hollywood and sports stars that do something stupid. That's pretty much what we get in America. Israel has been under attack, and the attack has been unbelievable. Um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rockets have been launched at Israel. Uh, we're going to show you a video right now. The video is about 30 seconds long. I want you to watch this video. There's no sound. Let's go ahead and roll this video. You look at that, this is what you're living with in Israel. So uh, nobody died in that, by the way. Uh, that's what you're living with in Israel. So you're driving down the road, hundreds of rockets are launched at you. You're driving down Florida Avenue, there's a rocket launched. If you retaliate, the UN comes against you and says, how evil you are. So Israel, time after time after time, is expected to just take Missile, rocket attack after rocket attack after rocket attack after rocket attack. I want you to imagine yourself living in a place like that. Uh, launching from the other side of North Mountain over here. Come the rockets, just aimlessly into the valley. And the world says, oh, just suck it up, buttercup. Oh, if it kills you, it kills you. If it kills your kids, it kills you. You guys are just so bad out there in the Hemet San Jacinto Valley. Uh, this is what happens to Israel. Day after day, week after week, month after month. People have asked me, they've said things like, well, uh, uh, Pastor Tom, why don't you go to Israel and see what it's really like? I go all the time. I've been there twice. I was just there uh, this year alone. And, and you know what I found out is most Jews and, and Christians and Arabs in Israel want to get along. Uh, but I also know this, that the world by large is against the nation of Israel. So much so that uh, Islamic Malaysia says its army is on standby waiting for the signal to invade Jerusalem and take it from the Jews. It's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> God owns Jerusalem. Zion is his. Jesus is going to return. He's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. And then there's this. Um, this rabbi, blessing Trump as king, shows he is the final president before the return of the Davidic dynasty. I look at this, I hear these reports coming out of Israel. I don't know about that, but I want you, I want you to just think of the couple of things, and then we're going to get in here into Daniel. We don't have a lot of verses to cover tonight. That's why I get to do all this, like a mini prophecy update first. So regarding Israel's elections, I want you to just think of this. Regarding Israel's elections, Israel's, Damon Duck writes, Israel's two main parties are in a standoff on creating a new government, but there's one thing that both agree on. Israel should annex the Jordan Valley and declare Israeli sovereignty over it. Um, uh, it's just crazy, when, especially when you go there and you realize that the world is demanding that Jews don't have the right to live in, um, in Samaria, um, which is part of Israel. 
uh, the, the world says Israel has to go back to the uh, pre-1967 war borders. Uh, and then they'll be at peace with their neighbors. That's not true. Israel did have the pre-1967 borders, and their neighbors all around them tried to eliminate them. Israel with the 1967 borders is nine miles wide. This, I mean, I want you to think of a country nine miles wide. How wide is this valley? And you're thinking, well, that should be sufficient for you. But it's just nuts. But Damon Duck writes, he talks about the fig tree. You know, Jesus talks about the fig tree, and it represents Israel uh, in the Bible. And Damon Duck talks about both of the government positions, uh, political parties that are against each other or are going to rise eventually to the top. Both want to annex this, this land. And he says, uh, this will cause the fig tree to put more leaves on. And you think of that, very interesting, is that Jesus said, when you see the fig tree begin to bud. So I just find it fascinating. Another thing he said, Israel will be wealthy in the latter uh, years, and the latter days. We know that from Ezekiel's prophecies. He talks about large deposits of oil and natural gas have been discovered off the coast. We've talked about that. But with the Leviathan gas find off the coast in the Mediterranean Sea, there's an international oil company called Energene, and it recently announced that they had greatly underestimated the amount of oil and natural gas that they discovered off the coast of Israel. It was already, it was already estimated to be an incredible amount. One of the largest finds in the history of the world. Now they're saying we've greatly underestimated it. Hence, the Bible tells us Russia is going to come into Israel. What many prophecy speakers have been saying for years, even decades and decades, it's going to be for energy, for oil and gas. At a time when, it, when it, Israel didn't even know they had any. And now they're saying, we've greatly underestimated what we had, and we thought we had a lot. And then get this, according to a business-oriented newspaper in Israel called Calculist, Israel's currency is now the strongest currency in the world. That is crazy, isn't it? Man. And according, this is one of the most exciting things to me, according to several scriptures, all of the Jews will return to the promised land when the Messiah comes. Um, I believe it's referring to the second coming of the Messiah, but non-believing Jews are still looking for the first coming of the Messiah. They'll be surprised. They'll... <laughs> several prominent rabbis have signed a document, I've been reading about this, saying that all of the Jews on earth are commanded by scripture, a, a mitzvah to return to the promised land. One rabbi said, it's clear that we are quickly approaching a watershed point in history when everything concerning the Jewish people will change. I don't know how the Jews will respond, uh, but I suspect that most secular Jews or non-religious Jews will ignore this command, but some religious Jews will take it seriously and soon start making preparations to move to the promised land. And I can tell you from being in Israel just two weeks ago, I have never, ever, ever seen Jerusalem so crowded. Um, in fact, I've met with the gentleman who's uh, the president of TBN in Jerusalem, and I told him, I had lunch with him, and I said, Jerusalem's at a tipping point. There are so many people there. You have tours there, you have people making their aliyah there. It's exciting, but uh, you can tell. There's a, there's a lot of pressure there. I was thinking, man, it was hard to get around. It, it made New York City seem like Hemet. I'm telling you, it was something else. And then finally, he says, the Jews have already built a railroad. They are now building hotels and restaurants. They've just voted to build a cable car to move 3,000 visitors per hour to the Western Wall uh, below the Temple Mount. Um, and he says, opponents will try to stop it, but it's clear that Israel is preparing to accommodate multitudes of visitors to the Temple Mount and likely to a rebuilt temple. And I showed you in the, in the prophecy update last week that Ben Shapiro has made a statement, it's time to put a synagogue on the Temple Mount. Folks, we live in exciting days. And I look at all of these different things that are going on, and I can't help but think that we need to be ready. And here in Daniel chapter 6, uh, we have this passage where it's when the government is a threat. So we start looking at everything. How do you respond? What are we supposed to do when the government is a threat? Um, it was R. Wallace in the message of Daniel. He said, empires rise and kings come and go. Fashions and lifestyles change. But one stable thing in the midst of all this change is Daniel himself. 
The man of God who does justice and loves kindness and walks humbly with his God. So as you and I walk through this world, we stand, right, we, we stand on righteousness. We stand on the truth. When it comes to the prophecies of the second coming of Christ, the Bible tells us mockers will be here in the last day, mainly coming from within a church. Scoffers will come. But also, just how do you deal with the pressures? How do you deal with the temptations? You deal with them the way Daniel dealt with them. He's a role model for, um, for how to live in a time when everything is threatened to go the direction that the Bible tells us about it is going to go uh, in the last days. It, it, it's as uh, Chuck Swindoll made note of uh, with Daniel, the reminder, he, he equated Daniel to the reminder of Jesus' words in uh, Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus said, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain descended and the floods came. And the winds blew and they beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. This is where Daniel is. His life is founded on the rock. And he's strong in the midst of the trials of this world, in the midst of what we see also coming and possible threats. And we read about this. We're not reading far tonight. Um, but chapter 6 of Daniel says this as we look. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar's gone. His grandson, Belshazzar, is gone. Daniel's now an old man. He's 90 years old. And it says here, chapter 6, verse 1, now we have a new king, Darius, Darius the Mede. It pleased Darius, the king of the Medo-Persian Empire, to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these, there were three governors, of whom Daniel was one of the governors, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in Daniel. And the king gave thought to settling him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was, a, he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the, the administrators, satraps, counselors, advisors, we've all consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you. In other words, whoever prays to anyone besides you, Darius, <clears throat> shall be cast into the den of lions. O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, the king signed the written decree. You look at this and, you, and, and I'm thinking, Darius, this, this sounds like a great idea. Everybody's got to pray to me. I like it. We're going to lift up the name of King Darius. Yeah, I like it. I like what the people are going to do. So what do we notice here? A couple of observations. The first is the plot against Daniel. So in verse 1, we read that there were 120 satraps that would be political officers, and there were three governors. Um, of the, so the satraps, they answer to the three governors. Of the three governors, one of them is Daniel. So with that, Daniel obviously, he has a great reputation with King Darius, and uh, he, as he did before with King uh, Nebuchadnezzar, remember that? But Daniel has the Spirit of the Lord in him, and he's set apart. There's something different about Daniel. So the king recognized that. So what do we have? First of all, we have the character of Daniel. Verse 3 says, an excellent spirit was in him. Uh, he was distinguished above everybody else. Um, He's, he's a governor. We think of political leaders today. Are there any you can say, man, they've got an excellent spirit in them. <laughs> he's distinguished above, you can say distinguished differently than everybody else. But didn't we just see something about crazy people running the country? Um, but imagine a political leader, no fraud, no intern scandals, no questionable business deals, no gifts from lobbyists, no accusations from his staff, um, just being, I mean, it's hard to imagine, but this is Daniel. He had no skeletons in his closet. So verse 5, 
the satraps and the governors, they're talking together. And you got the other people with them, and they're thinking, we're not going to find any, any fault with him. This guy's he's like squeaky clean. However, if we make a law that puts his God against a law we make, aha, then we have him. There's no dirt on him, so let's make a law to force the people to submit to this law, and this law will be against the God that Daniel worships. Make sense? Could that happen today? I want you to think of this. Look at this article. Are you ready for a catastrophically cold winter? Here's what the mainstream media won't tell you. All right. I've been hearing since Al Gore started his stuff. <laughs> catastrophically hot. Yeah. It's just going to get... The, by now, I, I know, because I remember when I started talking about this stuff 10, 15 years ago. By now, Hemet, California should have been beachfront property because everything was going to be so hot. All the icebergs were going to melt. Remember those days? It's not. So now there's a problem with these climate models. As some scientists are being honest, they're saying, no, we've got, no, we've got weather happening, right? That's what we actually have. Uh, but it used to be, you re very rarely anymore hear global warming. Typically what you hear now is climate change, right? Because the climate always changes. How can you argue against climate change? It's going to change tomorrow. Guess what? It was hot last week. It'll probably be cool again this week. And then it'll get hot again. And I, you want to know what's going to happen this July? Prediction. Where we live, it's going to be hot. It's going to be hot and it's going to be dry. And down south, it's going to be hot and humid. I'm just, I mean, I'm just a genius. In Minnesota, it's going to be freezing this, this winter. I just, climate change. It just does this weird stuff. But by me questioning climate change, I am now ridiculed and mocked online. You question it. You talk to other people. And all of a sudden, you're of the, you mean you don't believe in this? Wait a minute, we have to have laws that dictate where you can live and where you can't live. We have laws on how much beef you can and cannot eat. You do know those laws are coming, right? We're already watching the cows being forced out of California because they've got flatulence problem <laughs> but these are real laws they're taking place so i don't have to make this stuff up uh, i've told you this before agenda 2030 the un's agenda 2030 has climate change laws that dictate to you what you can and cannot do to the point where it's control over the masses of people even pope francis said in 2015 that we need climate laws that can be enforced so no nation can be above the law so you start looking at this and you go, as it was in the days of Daniel, let's make a law that is against the law of God. So too will it be in the last days. And what does the Bible tell us? Romans chapter 1, that the people in that day will worship the creation rather than the creator. So we see this. Daniel just gave us a preview of coming attractions. Uh, so we have the character of Daniel, we have the character of his detractors. Uh, Daniel's enemies, they trailed him. They followed him. They looked to see if he was getting a payoff from anybody. He's got to be up to something shady. We've got to find some dirt on him. But they could not. They were moved with jealousy. Uh, this is greatly bothering them. It seems that they are horrified. Verse 3 tells us that this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors because of the excellent spirit. And Darius the king wanted to set Daniel over everybody. They're thinking, how, can you, how could King Darius set a Jew over us? That's what this is. And they're greatly disturbed that Darius would do such a thing. They're moved with jealousies. So in verse 7, uh, it says here, uh, we have all, all the guys, they go to the king. Oh, King Darius, this is how you, this is how you butter somebody up, right? Look at this, verse, verse 6. Oh, King Darius, live forever. We think everybody should worship you. They were motivated by jealousy to kill Daniel. But they're buttering up the king. You really think I should live forever? You really think everybody should praise me? I like it. What do you got? Well, all of us have met all of the rulers, and we've decided that 
for 30 days, everybody should just pray to you. Well, it's not true, because they certainly left Daniel out of... They had, the, they had a closed-door meeting that Daniel was... Sound familiar? They had a meeting behind doors that Daniel was not allowed to come to. You get how this is going, right? Yeah, yeah, you can... I mean, the, the, the parallels are just quite re remarkable. They were liars and they were accusers. Like Satan, their father, the father of lies and the accuser of the brethren. A couple of things worth noting uh, before, we, before we get on with this. Um, is that Because Daniel was secure in God, he was secure in himself. This is what Daniel knew. Devoured or delivered, he would trust in God. He knew that no matter what, his life was in God's hands. Right? So, uh, because Daniel was secure he, in God, he was secure in himself. And he also knew this. Appointments and disappointments are ordered by the Lord. Uh, in, in Psalm 75, great psalm. I would encourage you to read it later. I wanted to read it, but we don't have time to go into it tonight. Um, the Bible tells us that God is the judge. He puts down one and he exalts the other. If Daniel knew this. If God wanted Daniel to live, then he would live. If God wanted Daniel to die, then Daniel would die. Um, David summed it up this way in, in Psalm 31. As for me, I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Do you know that the book of Acts actually tells us that God puts us in the very city and in the very neighborhood that we live in? God's determined that. And you wonder why you picked a person. <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, you wonder why you live where you live, right? I was down in Carlsbad the other day. Yeah, it was really nice. I'm thinking, why didn't I pick here? <laughs> you know, and, and, but God... He actually decides even where we're going to live, and he, he, and, and he appoints our days for us. Uh, the psalmist also said that we would be wise to number our days, for our days are in your hands. And here David says, my times are in your hands. So um, because Daniel was secure in God, he was secure in himself, and Daniel also understood appointments and disappointments. Both are ordered by the Lord. We like the appointments that are favorable toward us. We do not like the disappointments that are unfavorable. But we need the disappointments. Because they challenge us, they change us, they mold us. Uh, the Bible says all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to His purpose. Because we are being conformed into the image of God. The Bible doesn't say all things are good. All things work for good, because there's some bad stuff. It was not good that Daniel was going to be thrown into the lion's den, but the purpose behind it, God was going to use for good, in fact, for great things. So we have the plot against Daniel. We also have the prayer uh, of Daniel. Um, look at this, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, the decree of the king Darius said, yeah, let me sign the decree that everybody should pray to me. So Darius is, I mean, he's, oh, king, live forever, you're awesome. So when Daniel knew that, that King Darius had signed the agreement, he went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day, and he prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. And then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. We can imagine, aha! Daniel's got his window open. Aha, we caught him. We got the law. Now we've got him. Let's hook him. Let's throw him in jail. Get him into the lion's den. You can see how the whole thing is setting up. Daniel's simply, he gets word, okay, King Darius, Silas, wait a minute, I'm going to worship God first. I'm not going to worship a man. I'm going to worship God even at the threat of what the government is going to do to me. I will put God first. So these men, they went before the king and they spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? And the king answered, This is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. In other words, I cannot change it. So they answered and said before the king that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, he's one of the Jews, he doesn't show you due regard. Huh. 
O king, for the decree that you have signed, but he makes his petition three times a day. Oh, king, Daniel is against you. He just goes up there, he's arrogant, and he prays to that God of heaven. Um, to borrow some words from Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels, um, Daniel wanted to render to Caesar what rightly belonged to Caesar. He wanted to honor Darius. However, he would not give to the government that which belonged to God alone. And that is praise, that is worship, that is prayer. We live in a society that many people are saying, we want the government to be our God. We want the government to give us our paycheck. We want the government to give us every, everything you can think of. And that is what socialism teaches. I probably just got shut off of YouTube. Um, uh, but that is what it, it teaches. And you look, and this is what Daniel says, no, 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 I worship God. I keep God first. I'm not worshiping the government. It's not about the government first. Look at these quick articles. Um, I, want, I want you to see this because there are protests and civil unrest happening all over the world, right? Iran's top leader warns thugs as protests reach 100 cities in protest in Iran. Um, Czech anti-government protesters mark anniversary of revolution. Uh, Hong Kong protesters launch fire-dipped arrows at police in latest university clashes. Yellow vest protests. More than 100 arrest is, uh, arrested as violence returns to Paris. When you look out across the world, you look at Venezuela, you start looking at country after country after country, and you start finding their civil unrest. Uh, in Mexico, there's all types of murders. You have the drug cartel. You have all these things that are going against the government. Um, that's a sign of the last days. Nation against nation. Ethnos, the Greek word ethnos against ethnos. A people group, meaning against people group. So this happening, these things are escalating. It's happening all over the world. Uh, they're protesting against the government. Daniel's protest wasn't violent. Um, <clears throat> I believe Daniel, this, this will bother some people, but I believe Daniel's protest was righteous what it was is no uh, um, I've been accused of calling people arms I've never called anybody to arms um, but I do call people to God and say this is what we need to do I see what's happening in the world I can tell which direction this is going but I will worship the Lord God of heaven I'm not going to worship the government I'm going to praise God, and I'm going to pray to God. I'm going to pray to the Lord of heaven. Uh, listen, there's so many things that can get us all riled up. Um, but we need to go to God. And we need to direct our attention to God and do what Daniel did. Appointments and disappointments are ordered by the Lord. The Lord raises up kings and the Lord deposes kings. This is what I know. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming from heaven. He's going to come on a white horse. All those who know him are going to be coming with him. I'm going to be with him. Uh, I, I like what, uh, what uh, uh, um, was it Don Perkins said, you know, because we're all going to be, if you're a believer in Christ, you're coming on a horse with him. He said he already has his horse named. I think he said it the first time when he was here. What do you call it, Nelly? Kind of like, whoa, Nelly, I, I, I don't know, do you have your horse named? All I know is I'm coming with him. Don's going to be there. Hopefully all of you guys are going to be there, right? And, we're, and Jesus is going to be in the front. And I know this, Jesus is going to rule and reign. And he's going to set up a kingdom that no king will be able to come against. In Jerusalem, he will rule and reign from Jerusalem. And we will rule and reign uh, with him. With that, I've got a lot to go. You know what? I think I should, let me, I tell you what. Let me just, let me just wrap this up because I have to. It's late. Look, I have a lot of notes left. One, two, three, four. You know how long it takes me to get through four pages? I'm going to give you a hint. I just got through two. <laughs> All right? I've been up here 45 minutes, so we're going we're gonna to wrap this up. Um, we don't have to be in a hurry, but we do need to know this. Uh, we, we, we start putting everything together, and, and I know what the Bible tells us. Jesus himself said, when you see these things begin to take place, what do you do? Look up, for your redemption draws near. We watch everything coming about. 
And who are we to pray to? We are to pray to the Lord God of heaven. We are to praise the Lord God of heaven. But I find it so remarkable that Daniel is in such a position, so similar to what we see the direction of things going today. Um, as the laws are going to change, um, and the pressure to conform, the pressure to look to government to be our God, all these different things. Listen, this is a reminder. We stand firm on the word. Jesus is coming again, and we better be ready. Amen? Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word, and, and, and Lord, you are good. Help us to be strong in you. Help us to learn lessons like this lesson from Daniel. Uh, just the beginning of it, as he's threatened by the government to be thrown into a lion's den because he praises you. Lord, may you be glorified in us. May you strengthen us. May be, we be willing to be strengthened by you. Help us, Lord. Take over our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.